his own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden or hold, we say held, holden with the cords of his sins. That's the passage. All right, brother, be all right. Back, Your Honor. Now, the verse I've read says that uh, of a wicked person, that the thing that gets them and, and hangs on to them is their own iniquities, their own sins. The Bible's full of that. Now, uh, the Bible's full of verses that indicate that the worst judgment God can bring upon a man is just leave him to his own devices. And uh, it has statements in it like uh, in Jeremiah, the Lord said one time, he said, uh, I'll render unto them uh, their works, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have rejected me. That is, the Lord said, the way I'm going to pay that bunch back is I'm going to let them have what they want. I'm going to let them, I'm going to give them the fruit of their thoughts. And time and time again in the Bible, the Bible makes it clear that one of the greatest punishments that God can bring upon a man or a nation is just to let them go their own way. And this verse here says that a wicked man will be held with his own sins and his own iniquities will bind him. And uh, that reminds me of the fact that the sin is like a serpent. When I read hell, see, and bound and fastened, uh, I, the thing that comes to my mind is a boa constrictor. Uh, all throughout the Bible, sin is likened to a serpent, or uh, the devil is likened to a serpent. Uh, and there's something about a snake that just uh, curdles your blood anyway, if you're normal. Uh, Jean Dix Dixon, she dreams about sleeping with him, you know, and gets a blessing from it. She must be kind of, you know, a little bit abnormal, brother. How about you get a blessing out of uh, dreaming about sleeping with snakes is beyond me. And Jean Dixon said when she slept, you know, she dreamt this beautiful serpent came into bed with her and called around her and looked her in the eyes with a look so full of love, you know. <laughs> man, that old cold, slimy, wet thing going around you, man. Woo, man. <laughs> And, you know, people, they buy her books, you know, and think she's quite a prophetess, and she probably is. But anyway, uh, throughout the Bible, that thing is likened to a, a serpent. Uh, when Jesus wants to liken himself uh, uh, to sin, God made him to be sin, he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Uh, when uh, uh, the devil approaches Eve in the Garden of Eden, he approaches in the form of a serpent. Sin is like a serpent. And, you know, if you've got sin trouble, you've got real trouble. Now, there's some troubles in this life you can get help with, and some troubles folks can help you with, but I'll tell you, there's one kind of trouble nobody can help you with but God, and if you don't get help uh, from God, a God for it, you can't get help. There's some things in this life your mother can help you with. There comes a time when mama can't help anymore, you grow up, or mama dies. There's some problems in this life your friends can help you with. I don't want a man to get in a jam, and his friends got him out of a jam. Or there's some problems in this life the government can help you with really is. You don't believe that, but it really is. I mean, uh, there, there is a time when pensions and unemployment insurance and Medicare and those things might help a fellow out. You don't want to lean on them too strong. If you want to see what happens to folks that count on the government to help them, study the American Indian. <laughs> they fix him, brother. They fix him. So the government can't always help you, and your friends can't always help you, but uh, see, uh, you could get troubles that only God can help you with, and life is filled with troubles. Uh, Job says, man is born into trouble as a spark fly upward. And a life without any trouble isn't worth living. I believe that. I believe man has it easy all his life. He never mounts the hill of beans. And the most dull, uninteresting, boring people in the world to me are the people that never have any problems. They just bore me to tears. I don't even like to be around them. I like folks with problems. Because <laughs> I got problems. <laughs> I can't stand these folks that have it just going all right all the time. They don't understand anything. Uh, you know, if you have been down the mouth and depressed and never been broke and never been persecuted and never been discouraged, uh, how in the world can you understand anybody who is? But most folks, they get to share of trouble. Life is filled with troubles. Some of them are big, some of them are small. A matter of fact, man's whole life, it seems to me, in the 20th century is just trying to find ways to get out of having trouble and make it more convenient, make it more easy. You know, they have these seat belts to keep you from having a wreck. Uh, I've got them in my car. I've got shoulder belts in my car. Sunday you may find me dead out on the highway, and uh, you send our brother up and just one of those seat belts, he wouldn't be dead. That's right. He'd be in the hospital for about nine months. I don't care if I care to be in the hospital nine months. Somebody said it saved a life. I don't know. Paul said to depart and be with Christ is far better. I heard of a fellow one time had a terrible wreck, and I asked him how he got in that wreck, and he said, well, I, I left the house and knew I forgot something, and he said, I let go of my steering wheel of fast my, seat, my safety belt, <laughs> and blam, you know, he hit into the thing. I'm thinking over to some time when you avoid one trouble, you just run right smack in another one. And life is filled with troubles. Uh, you have them all your life. 
Little boy comes in, you know, and starts cutting teeth. Got trouble. You hear him yell at night. You hear him yell at night. And he pinches his finger in the door. More trouble. Hollering, crying. And he cuts himself with a penknife. More crying. Then he meets some kid at school and he beats him up, you know, and then more trouble. And he gets over that. And he gets over that and then he gets caught stealing some of his pencil. And then he gets by that trouble and gets over that trouble and then he flunks. And then he passes his grades and gets on through and gets up in high school. And then he falls in love with some girl that won't have nothing to do with him. And he's just around, moons and broods over that a while. And then he gets over that, you know. And, and he gets over that and then he gets in trouble with the principal. And then he gets over that thing there. And then he runs out of money and has to go to making a living. He makes a good living, you know, and grows up and gets married and gets over his problems for a while. And the first baby comes, he runs out of money again. And he gets the money back in, gets things going pretty good, and the house burns down. He gets him a new house, gets that fixed up, and then he has a car wreck. Then he gets the car wreck fixed up, and the mother-in-law moves in. Then he gets mama taken care of. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, that's just life, brother. You just got to face it. A uh, man is born to trouble as a spark flopper, and you're never too old to have trouble. You're never too old to have trouble. And some things that seem like great problems to you are nothing to me, and some of the things that seem great to me are, are nothing to you. We're all different. Uh, you take, that's one way you mark immature people. You know how you spot children, kiddies? When they think the whole world is just caving in over nothing. That's how you spot little children. And some people, 30, 40 years old, they never grow up. They never grow up. The first time somebody says something mean about them, they think the world's come to an end. Well, great guns, man, grow up. The first little thing comes along, you know. Some of our folks, you say, well, Brother Rutland, you was in the pulpit against me. Oh, good night, man. Uh, you get a bottle and suck on it. Suck your thumb. Shoot marbles. Play with pops. Great day in the morning, man. Get out of your three-cornered pants. Now, that's, uh, listen, that's how you, one of the ways you spot these immature, uh, nipple-sucking, baby-sucking babies is the first little, just a little old tiny thing comes up, <laughs> you know. No, don't yell at me that way. <laughs> they're babies. They're children. Uh, you folks have children. Don't you know how children act? You know, uh, Daddy, he got this. Mama, he got this. Mama, she took it. Well, Mama, I had it. Bah, bah, bah. That's a baby. That's a baby. And one of the ways you spot maturity, as the troubles get bigger and bigger, you get more and more victory, and you can overcome bigger and bigger troubles. That's part of growing up. And some people have troubles. Boy, I'll tell you this, some people in this world, man, they really have troubles. You know, if you're a minister and talk to a lot of people, you see it. You see it. Any man that preaches like I do and keeps the contacts I've got, boy, I talk about problems, man. You talk about problems. Why, uh, most folks come to this church, you're rich and happy and mature and well-adjusted, man. You haven't got any problems. You ought to see some real problems. You ought to see them where the husband's in jail and the mother has diabetes and the seven children there to raise and they're a year apart and they're bare feet and there's no income and the income does come in, the oldest kid steals it and all that kind of thing. You ought to get you in one of those things right there. Like up in the hospital today, the man's, the woman's in one room with cancer and the man's in the other room with diabetes and they're both in the hospital and nobody take care of the family and no money coming in. One of those things. But you know, uh, still, problems are problems and, and uh, what might be a big problem to you is not one to me and vice versa and yet uh, it's a problem. To you, it's a problem. A uh, little old things come up, you know, that you wouldn't think were any kind of problem, and they're, and they're just, just terrible things. You know, you know, uh, women can be humiliated, you know, by those, just the smallest things sometimes. I read of a case of a young lady, and I'm sure you ladies appreciate this. To me, it wouldn't mean anything, you know, but a woman, it means an awful lot. Uh, she was down in the basement washing clothes, and just at a chance impulse while she was washing, she tried to get everything. She just took off the dress she had and threw it in the washing machine. And she was there in a slip washing those clothes, and then while that was going, she saw a spider and a web up in the corner, and she went and got a broom to knock down that web, and because it was dust up there, she afraid she might get dirt in her head, so she picked up one of her, her son had a football helmet lying over in the corner, and she put that football helmet up and was just going to knock down that web with that broom, and there was a knock at the door. <laughs> and the only thing in that room that she could cover herself with was a raccoon coat. And she grabbed that raccoon coat, and threw that thing on, in came the gas man. And there she was standing that raccoon coat with a broom <laughs> and a football helmet on, brother. <laughs> and that gas man came in, you know, <laughs> read the meter and walked out. As he walked out the door, he said, I hope your side wins, lady. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. 
Now, you know, a thing like that, if a man caught in a position like that, he'd have something smart to say, you know, back, you know. But a woman, oh, that's, oh, boy, that's just, I mean, that's, that's the end of it, man. And so people, they have, they have problems. And like I said before, there's some problems that your folks can help you with. There's some problems your teachers can help you with. There's one kind of problem that you're going to have in life, and it's common to man ever since Adam. You're going to have a problem with sin. And when you've got trouble with sin, there's only one person that can help you, and that's God. That's God. I believe psychiatrists can do something for people sometimes. They really do. I think electrotherapy and hydrotherapy might work in some cases on a certain things. But I'll tell you one thing, it won't do any good with it all. Sin. Sin. When you've got sin problems, you've got problems that God has to take care of. And people are foolish when they think that uh, they can solve a sin problem uh, with a priest. A priest can't handle a sin problem unless it's the high priest up in heaven. There's only one person in the world that can solve that problem, and that's Jesus Christ. Uh, God only sent one man in this world without sin, and he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He had trouble. And if you have a sin problem, you've got a problem, and you've got a problem that only God can settle. Now, sin is like a serpent. The different kinds of serpents, uh, they're constrictors. A constrictor will do like you see here. Uh, he'll wrap around a man. And he'll wrap around a man, and it isn't that they have the power to crush him. Of course, the big one, you get a 30-foot one, anaconda or a python over there, they can do it. But a boa, a boa constrictor just wrap around a man, and then when he breathes out, you see, he constricts. And then when the fellow breathes in, his lungs weren't as big as they were before. And then he breathes out, he constricts again. And as you breathe in and breathe out, you just breathe smaller and smaller and smaller until you're dead. And you know sin's that way? And when sin get around, it'll just come in closer and closer and tighter and tighter and tighter until you can't breathe. The Bible says his own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be held. He shall be held with the cords of his sin. You can take a thread and wrap it around a man, around his fingers a couple times, he can break it. You wrap it around four or five times, he'll have a harder time breaking it. You take a spool of thread and wrap it around a man's fingers until the whole spool is gone in and out, and as a man in the world, he can part those fingers when you get through. A uh, sin like a serpent, the different kind of serpents. Poisonous serpents that kill a man with a bite are not constrictors, but they can kill a man uh, like a copperhead or a water moccasin, cotton mouth to call them down here, or you got different kind of moccasins, and diamondback rattlers and cobras and coral snakes. A coral snake's a beautiful thing. A coral snake is yellow and scarlet and red and black. Beautiful thing. And kill you in about 20 minutes. Uh, they kill the nibbling. They don't strike like a rattlesnake. They get a loose piece of skin like between your fingers, between your toes while you're swimming or hanging around the rocks and just, <laughs> and just nibble on it. And then you got about 20 minutes. Uh, I've heard of some men that were immune to it and that had the snake serum for so long they built up an immunity and got bit without dying, but those are the exceptions and they prove the rule. A coral snake finish in about 20 minutes. And then you have a cobra and he'll finish in less than that. And a good old king cobra knock you off in about 12 minutes. Over in Vietnam, they name the snakes. They call them one-steppers, two-steppers, and three-steppers. And that just means that after he hits you, you can take three steps on some of them. And some of them you take two steps, and some of them you take one step. <laughs> that thing goes blip, and you got one step, and you drop over. A rattlesnake, when he strikes, he pull back. And then when he comes forward, he, you don't see the fangs till he hits. And then when he hits, those two front fangs come out of the front of the mouth, just like a hypodermic needle. And just, and just spit that milk right through those two teeth just like an injection and goes in your blood. And if it's a sure enough potent one, you'll die. You'll die. A lot of folks down south get bit by rattlesnakes that don't die. But they swell up and they get sore and they hurt. And it does something to their system. Uh, some snakes, when they poison you, they poison your blood system. A couple of the cobras, he ruins your nervous system. And the whole thing just all comes apart. Uh, one time I was preaching over in South Alabama. We were driving down the road in a truck, and we saw a rattlesnake taking his time to get across the road. And down there in that particular part of the country, uh, you, just, uh, you just kill every rattlesnake you see. you, you got to. <laughs> you keep population down. And so when they saw that thing going across there, these farm boys stopped. And I got to the back end of that truck and got a jack uh, handle there. One of them said, uh, he said, Brother Pete, let me handle this. I've killed these things before. I said, help yourself. And gave it to him. And... The other kid got a tin can and came up behind this old snake, and he was about over in the ditch, about a six-foot diamond back rattler, about yay big. And that one farm boy came up there with that tin can, and he threw it up in front of that snake's head, and that old snake went, like that, 
And the other kid took that jack handle, and he's a good shot. About from here to there on that piano, he threw that thing. He hit that snake right in the head. And then he stepped forward before that snake could recover and pick up the jack handle and just beat his head right off his body. And I want to tell you something. By the time he clubbed that snake three times, that snake was already coiling. I mean, the head coming off, that thing was beginning to coil back. And he got in, he got the head off him. We pulled back the mouth there, and pretty fangs you ever saw, about two and a half inches long, sitting there like that. Boy, just, just go right through you. And you know, folks that are like that about sin, you know, they say, well, it won't hurt me. Well, it'll depend how you look at it. Well, everybody else does it. Well, uh, I can get away with it. My case is a special case, and I'm different than other folks. And then pretty soon, <laughs> see? Bit! <laughs> in it comes. In it comes. Poor you have made the foot. I talked to farmers who've been bitten by rattlesnakes and lived. I talked to a farmer over in South Alabama one time, was out under his tractor, fixing his tractor, and he's monkeying around under there, and all of a sudden, right under his back, he just felt something go bump, and it hurt. And he rolled out front of that tractor, and he laid down on the ground rattler, a little rattler about a, less than a foot long, about a foot long, and just color gray dust. You can't even see them. They're just poisonous to the big ones, some of them worse. And he got back to the house and had his wife cut him open with a jackknife back there and bled a while and took some medicine for it, and he got well. But he said every year that place feels bad, and he swells up and turns kind of purple and feels as sick as a dog in a certain kind of weather. The little old thing about that long. Uh, you know, my first introduction to snakes was in that part of the country, and I, I knew something about snakes from reading about them, but I never, I never actually contacted so many. Uh, there's a strip of land that runs, I tell you it runs from, the, the south end of it would be about Century, Alabama, or Plumerton. And that strip runs across South Alabama and South Georgia and North Florida over to Tallahassee. You take a strip about 20 miles wide, you decide that state line over there, and brother, you talk about snakes. Man, if you want to be a snake specialist, just go over and live over there, around Jay and the Century and back there toward Andalusia and, uh, and Florala and Wing and Falco and, and back up in there. Boy, they got them. They got them. They got them. I had a meeting over there. I was over there two weeks. In 14 days, every day of that meeting, I saw a snake. I got for a while, when I'd get out of the car to go to the church, I'd get out like this, going to the churchyard, like this, looking for him. <laughs> One old farmer down there, he said, you know, he said, a rattlesnake's peculiar. He said, he's ornery. He said, you get him upset, and he'll hit you. But he said, sometimes he'll hit you without rattling. And he said, other times, he'll rattle and won't hit. And he said, I've known him sometimes and not do anything. He said, I was out picking beans the other day in the bean patch and stuffed my hand down the beans, picking beans, and ran right off the back cross, just ran right down his back. They said, that snake never did anything. He just lying there asleep, just let me scratch his back. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and did you know sin is like that? I mean, there'll be some sin, see, that you just barely touch or you become acquainted with or you just pass by, the thing doesn't hit you. You don't hang around long enough to give time to strike. But it seems like a serpent. Up there in the central Alabama was a friend of some friends of mine, and he had a colored fellow working for him. They called him Indian Joe. He's a sambo. I mean, you know what a sambo is, let me see you here. Oh, well, he's a sambo. And, and he used to go down the bank and do this uh, uh, grab fishing. Fellas go out in this old muddy warrior river, and they reach up under the bank, see, and grab the fish. Now, I'll tell you, I, uh, I've tried a lot of things in my day, but I'm not man enough to try that, and I'm never going to be. <laughs> and get in that old muddy water, and he reaches up under the bank, see, and he'd pull it out and throw it up in the bank, and he'd call it. He'd go down the bank, and the fellow would take a cycle on the bank, and that old color fellow be out about a shoulder deep in water, and he'd brim, catfish, bass, moccasin <laughs> and throw that moccasin up the back <laughs> and I don't know how many times he'd been bit he'd been but he'd been bit a lot of times didn't bother him any didn't bother him I guess you get immune to certain things I guess place you get so hard you don't even know what what the thing is doing to you or some of those fellows go into water up under those banks to get them and I've often thought about that just reaching out there in that muddy water just feeling around you know with your hand do you just feel something just cool as ice and just wet and clammy <laughs> and just run your finger down it, you know, and have it coil back this way. <laughs> and that's what those fellas do, you know, reach you there and grab them. Uh, sin like a serpent. Uh, in that part of the country where I had that meeting, like I said, I, every day we, we were in that meeting, I saw a serpent somewhere. One day I came out of there and we were driving away to dinner. We went over a bridge. There were two moccasins, dead ones, hanging over the bridge on a rail. One day we came out of a, of a place we've been eating. We've been talking about snakes all the time we've been eating. I got curious, got to ask a lot of questions, you know, and they talked about them. They'd seen plenty of them. 
I remember one day we sat at a meal, we talked about rattlesnakes for an hour and a half. When we got all through, there was one farmer there at the table in that area, and he said, well, Brother Upman, he said, the only thing I want to know about snakes is which way can I run. <laughs> and when I, when I heard that, I thought of that verse that says, I'd have you to be a simple concerning that which is evil. See, that's the simplest solution, just get out. And we talked about that thing and talked about that thing and talked about that thing until I had snakes on the brains. Uh, he said, he said, if you ever go hunting down here, Brother Rubman, let your dog come behind you. I said, why? He said, because if your dog goes ahead of you, he'll get the rattlesnake upset, and then it'd be just time to hit you coming behind him. Let the dog come behind you, and he'll get mad at you and hit the dog. <laughs> and one fellow down there, you know, was hunting, and he stopped, and one of those things caught right between his legs. <laughs> and he said, he put that shotgun right down like that, and boom! <laughs> lifted him a foot off the ground <laughs> and they kept talking about snakes and talking about snakes and finally I, didn't, I thought I was seeing the snakes and after we talked there an hour and a half we got up and left the meal and we started out the door and we were walking down the driveway and the fellow said snake and I went oh I got man he said freeze I froze I said where and he said right down there and I looked down like that and there wasn't any snake there but if a snake had gone across that driveway while we'd been eating see and you just see that trail where it flipped across the pathway there but he told me to stand still you know I was standing still I was obeying orders and I said what do you I said what do you do when you stand still he coils up anyway he said you just better pray the wind don't blow your pan leg <laughs> so send it like a serpent why down at that meeting we had in Florida Alabama a snake got cut uh, got caught in the fan they had an old country church with a mechanical fan in the back of it and one night that fan didn't work, and we got up there and got messing around with it. And one fellow there could take that kind of stuff apart and said, let me have it. And he was a, he was a Marine, just been, got out of the Marine. He'd been in about 10 years, real tough, hard kid. And he climbed up on a chair there in the back of that room and got banging around that fan and jimmy around with that thing to get it to work. And all of a sudden, out of that fan came the prettiest rattlesnake you ever saw. He just looped down like this and right up like that, right in front of that fellow's face. And that old boy standing there like this, Look at that snake, and that snake looking at him. You never saw such a pair in all your life. That snake right there, those old glass eyes looking at him. This kid just like that, looking back at him. And that kid looked at that snake, and he reached out like this and picked up a hammer he had down there in his waist and <coughs> hit him on the head and killed him, man. <laughs> Didn't bother him any, you know. And I, I saw that thing there, and I said to myself, you know, there's the some sins. If you just face them, you know, you can whip them. If you just face them. Just face right up to him, kill him on the spot. Well, others are not so easy. And uh, you take down that same part of the country, and I'm telling you the truth, in the same meeting, the lady came there, she's, her husband owned a fa uh, tractor uh, place over in uh, Florala. And she's a real high class lady, you know, drove a big old Cadillac, and I don't mean make fun of her, she's just kind of blue blooded, you know. Like McGinley said, you could fill your fountain pen every time she sweat. <laughs> I didn't say that, but Jane McGinley said that. And so she come in that Cadillac, and I never forget one day in that morning meeting of Bible study, she came coming here in a big old Cadillac, and all those country folks, you know, coming bare feet in the back of tractors and everything. She comes in this big old Cadillac and comes in there and parks, and she gets out and she says, Good morning! <laughs> and she steps right out there in a rattlesnake going right under that Cadillac. And it just, and the dust, the dirt was real soft in that churchyard, and she just pressed that rattlesnake right down into the dirt, and luckily she had on low heel shoes, and she just pressed him right down the dirt and he didn't get mad. And he just went off on the Cadillac, mind his own business. But he went off on the Cadillac and somebody said, Snake, Mr. So-and-so. And she went, oh! <laughs> Turned around and saw that thing like had a heart attack. Now, she just, she just stepped in the thing accidentally, see? And uh, James says, Blessed is the man that uh, endures temptation. Count all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing the trial of your faith worketh patience. So you have those kind of sins. But sin is like a serpent. Now, some sins are pretty, like coral snakes. Some sins are ugly, like rattlesnakes and like moccasins. Are you taking that uh, meeting I had down there in the second week of that meeting, about the fifth night? Uh, the farmer where I was staying went out to get his cows, and uh, when he came back in, he saw something kind of bright there by the, the door sill in the back porch, and he put his flashlight on it. He'd step in the coral snake going out to get the cows. And hadn't even seen it. Just going out the door. Out the cow, step down there and squash that thing flat, right on the, right on the door sill there. Uh, sometimes you run to sin like that, but most of the time we fool with sin and play with sin and tolerate sin. And when I say that, I mean any kind of sin. Christians have funny ideas about sin. 
Uh, they get an idea if they give up the fornication, they're drinking, they're swearing, and give up the cigarettes, that that, that guarantees them a kind of a holiness other people don't have. I tell you, four sins will kill your testimony and kill your fruitfulness and kill your joy and kill your ministry, brother. Greed, envy, bitterness, and discouragement. Try them, brother, for size. You want something that'll kill you, that'll kill you. You know those Jake Frank Norris used to say when some of those young fellows would uh, get up there and preach about this and that? He was a character. You know, I understand fellas like that. A lot of folks don't. But Frank Norris would come in while a fellow's preaching and say, boy, you never been called to preach. Go back to the farm you came from. And the fellow would blow, 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 you know, and Frank would say, you never been anywhere, you never know nothing. Go out and get drunk a while and learn what life's about. <laughs> you know, and folks say, well, I did him telling people that. Well, I see, I wouldn't tell folks, but I understand, see, that kind of a, an approach. I understand that kind of thing. A lot of folks don't. What, what Frank Norris trying to tell that fellow is this. Before you get up there and start talking about those things, you better know what you're talking about, and that doesn't mean that you have to go out and get in it to know. But it does mean this. It means if you're going to get up there and start saying everything this fella does that I don't do is a sin, then you haven't got it. You haven't got it, brother. There are more kinds of sins than smoking cigarettes. There are more kinds of sins than getting drunk. There are more kinds of sins than gambling. You know what wrecks most Christians? Bitterness, envy, distrust, worry, discouragement, cowardice, laziness, covetousness. Did you ever hear about those sins? They'll fix you. They'll whip you. You know what Frank Norris meant? He meant, young fella, if you can't do any better than that, you go out there and get pied and get tanked up, and when you come to, you fall down on your knees and ask God to forgive you and pray with tears and ask God to wash you in the blood for such a wretch as you are and then get back up there and come at it again, knowing that God is good and God can forgive you and God can clean you where you can appreciate God and appreciate what a skunk you are. That's what he meant. That's what he meant. And I'd rather have a dozen skunks go out and do like that and then repent and get right about it than a hundred of these pious, smug, self-satisfied Christians that think because they clean up here and clean up here and clean up here, the whole thing is clean. Listen, man, it ain't clean. It's clean inside. And boy, listen, where there's envy down there eating at you, you know what it'll do? That thing will coil around you to where you can't stand the sight of him. And you can't stand the sight of her. And you've got to have everything he has. And you've got to have everything she has. And you resent everything he gets. And you resent everything she gets. And you feel like you're slighted. And you feel like you're set on the shelf. And you feel like they don't deserve the goodness. And you feel like you deserve it. And that thing will just get around you and just squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. And just break every bone in your body. Just take you like a berry basket, brother. And just... And I'll tell you, you do better, you do better go out there and rob a bank and get right in the penitentiary and witness than when you would to go on that way. And that discouragement will get you. It'll get you. It'll whip you. You start to get down in the mouth. Down. You start to get down in the mouth. Down in the mouth. Get bitter and get discouraged. Say, what's the use? What's the use? It's no good. God is never going to hear me. God is never going to use me. It's too long. It's too hard. Oh, why try? Well, I might as well quit. Well, there's no point in it. You know what that thing will do? That thing will just get around you like fornication or adultery, immorality or drunkenness or temper or anything else, and it'll just squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and <coughs> and go those bones, brother. You're a dead duck. You're a dead duck. Sin like a serpent. You know what John said? John said all unrighteousness is sin. You know what that means? It means just what it says. All unrighteousness is sin, and it'll kill you. It'll get you. You see this fellow right here? He's got problems. Brother, he's got problems. <laughs> Sin like a serpent. Uh, but my text says, His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He'll be bound. Someday you'll say, I'll break loose my chain. I'm going to get loose. I'm going to break it. And you'll start stretching your muscles and try to bust loose from that chain, and great beads of perspiration will pop out in your forehead, and your muscles will be descended, and you'll sweat and you'll groan, and that old chain will cut deep into your flesh, and when you die, you'll hear that chain rattle like a funeral dirge for your soul, brother. That thing will get you, and it'll bind you, and it'll hold you until your whole life is just one tantalizing, exhausting sweat and struggle against that thing that's trying to choke the life out of you. Sin's like a serpent. Any kind of sin like a serpent. It'll finish you. Look at this fellow down here. He said, I'm smart. I've got a college education. I can get away with it. I know the ways and means, you know. <laughs> That's all left to him. 
Bible says the wage of sin is death. The Bible says the soul it's sin if it shall die. Sin has no more respect for a Ph.D. than a high school freshman. Sin has no more respect for a four-star general than a buck private. And listen, sin has no more respect for a minister or a deacon or a priest or a bishop or a pope than if for any drunken bum in the gutter. And if you had to be a saved drunken bum in the gutter or a proud unsaved pope, you'd better be a saved drunken bum in the gutter, brother, if you had your choice. But drunken bum just gone to the dogs, pope's done gone to the devil. <laughs> now you take, you take sin, it's like a serpent. And th that, that old rattlesnake... The more I study that thing, the more I study rattlesnakes and sharks, rattlesnakes and sharks, the more I feel like getting out of the water and getting off the land <laughs> when you study those things. Down there around Florale, you know what happened about, this happened about 50 years ago before they had much of a town down there. There were two boys out there in the woods chasing a rabbit, and that rabbit ran on the hollow end of a log, and they couldn't see it back, and they were all grown with moss and dirt and clogged up. And, and they went down that log, and it was hollow, and they found a knot hole down that log about eight feet. And the one boy got him a stick, and he stuck it in that hole in that log and began to kind of do like this. And he said to the boy, said, I feel him in there, Jimmy. I, I feel him in there. I feel something kind of give him the back end of that stick. And the other boy said, well, reach in and get him. And so this kid puts the stick down and reaches down that hole about a foot, and bit that thing came out there, the big old rattler hanging on, teeth in here, teeth in here, shook that thing off, screaming. Boys got on down the street in Florida, back before it was much kind of a town, tried to get some snakes there and there from a drugstore, wouldn't sell it to them, didn't have the money to buy it with. Boy died in the street in front of the drugstore. And they passed a law in that town still over there that anybody can get free, uh, free snakes there any time they want them. That's one of the laws. Whether you've got money to pay for it or not, you get bit by a snake, you can get the stuff from the druggist with you don't have a dime. You know what I heard about that? I said to myself, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you know something? If you ever get healed, you're going to get healed free. Free, or you're going to die on the street. Did you ever see an anti-snake kit or an anti-snake bite kit? Or the little kits they sell to sporting goods stores and feed and stream magazine? A little kit about this big with a rubber suction cup in it and a razor blade and a little kind of a tourniquet. And they say when that snake hits you like he hits you here in the leg, uh, you're supposed to take that tourniquet and wrap it around somewhere between where it hits you in your heart. And then you take that razor blade and you cut a cross mark there where he bit you. And then you slash yourself eight places between where he bit you and where the tourniquet is to let out the blood. And so you take that place those fangs are and put a cross right there. I thought to myself, amen, brother, amen. You got it right. You got it. It's a cross. And a cross only in the world will heal you. Down there in that part of the country, two boys went out there and they went swimming. And they got out there in a the water hole and jumped in. One boy said, watch me dive, Jimmy. And he went down that old muddy hole, you know, you couldn't see much in the bottom of it. Boy, he came up, his face was just ashen. And he said, get me out of here, Jimmy. Something eat me up, Jimmy. Something eat me up. And he pulled him up there in the bank, and about eight minutes, that kid was dead. And he jumped into a nest of those water moccasins. And when they came out there and drained that pool, the construction men, they found 50 cotton out moccasins in the bottom of that pool. And folks say, oh, they won't hit you underwater. They hit him underwater. They hit him on the water. I thought I was up there by Tennessee Dam, where I used to fish up around Pickwick Dam on the, one of these, uh, what do you call them, uh, ski things. And he fell off when they picked him up. He's dead in about 20 minutes. They thought he'd fallen to Bob Wire. And they went over there and looked around for Bob Wire, and the only Bob Wire there, but there sure was a nest of moccasins. You know, folks say, well, they won't strike underwater. They hit them underwater, brother. You know, you get out in the world, they say, oh, come on, take a little bit. It won't kill you. You know, it won't hurt you. You won't die. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. The Bible says, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. The wage of sin is death. The soul of sin, if it shall die, you, you won't get away from it. Sin is like a serpent. Sin like a serpent. Down that part of the country, one time they found the uh, body of a colored man back in a lumber pile, lying back there, a big old six-foot-four buck lying back there. And he had a rattlesnake in his hands, and he choked that rattlesnake to death. And the the, the, the colored man was dead, and so was the rattlesnake. They're just lying there in the lumber, and that rattlesnake had one fang in here and one fang in here. And that old colored boy had to hold that thing and squeeze that thing to death, and they were both dead. And Bible says it's a sin unto death. And maybe it'll take you all your life to whip it. I don't know. Maybe it'll kill you before you kill it. But uh, sin like a serpent. Sin like a serpent. Don't play with sin. 
The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. The Bible says the soul that sinneth that shall die. The Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Don't play with it. Down Arizona, New Mexico, along that area there somewhere, a Mexican child was at the front door playing with the screen door, a little two-year-old boy. He pushed the door open, let it close, and pushed it open, and let it close. And his daddy was in the back room shaving. He heard his little boy go, hee-hee-hee-hee, and bam, the door would slam. And then hee-hee-hee, bam, the door would slam. And then hee-hee, bam, the door would slam. And the old man smelled that kind of peculiar odor, and they, they put off an odor once in a while. And terror-stricken, he ran the next room and crossed the flat floor where they looked out toward that front door. And that little two-year-old boy had that door, screen door, was pushing it with his hand. And right outside that screen door was a nice eight-and-a-half-foot diamond back rattler coiled up. And every time that door opened, he'd strike at the screen door. And the screen door would always just close. He wouldn't get in the crack. That boy would go, hee-hee-hee, bip, hee-hee-hee, bip, hee-hee-hee, bip. And the Bible says fools make a mock of sin. And I tell you, when you see these young people like we saw the other night down there, and all these hippie and Burke lives all laughing and talking about their faith in love and reevaluating and rethinking the new morality and love, 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 and let's all love, let's all mix, and let all get together, and ha, 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 look at those three preachers, and ha, 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 look at that Bible, and ho, 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 look at those old standards of morality, and ha, 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 look at that branch preacher, ha, 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 bit, ha, 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 bit, ho, 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 bit, and one day he's coming through, and you never know what hits you. You'll never know what hits you. They picked up a fellow one time in a, in a wheelchair down in Tijuana, Mexico, and he was down there going up down the street, and he had a selling pencils. And a GI on leave, you know, had to cross the border down in Tijuana and came up to him and said, I'll take a couple old man. Flipped him a quarter, and the old man said, Where are you going, young fella? Oh, I said, down such and such place, a famous place. Said, You're going to have me a good time. So I can't come along. The old man gave him a couple of pencils and said, uh, let me tell you a story. He said, uh, 15 years ago, he said, I, I was stationed at this place in Texas. And he said, I want to cross the border one night. He said, one hour and 20 minutes. And he said, I've been like this ever since. He said, look at it. And the kid looked at that pencil. And each one of those pencils, there was a scripture written, the wage of sin is death. Death, brother, it's death. And it ain't worth an hour and 20 minutes. The wage of sin is death. Sin like a serpent. You say, well, how in the world am I going to get victory over it? How am I going to overcome it? Well, education can't make it. The Bible doesn't say if education shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Or the church can't make it. The Bible doesn't say if the church shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. The Bible doesn't say if baptism make you free, you shall be free indeed. The Bible doesn't say if Alcoholics Anonymous shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. It'll have to be some other way. It'll have to be some other way. I'd be one of the worst stories I've ever heard in my life. It took place right down in Bradford, Florida, on that the highway that goes down to Swanee. Uh, down there, a couple came down through there from Arkansas, poor family, had four or five children, an old rickety old car. They stopped in one of those cheap motels you find alongside the Swanee, down around that area. And the, well, the woman was just worn out, little baby, about a year old, just been crying and screaming and hollering, you know, and her nerves were just shattered. And they got in that little old motel down there and put things out, and the baby just screaming and screaming and screaming. And she finally had all she could stand. She just said, shut up, and she put the baby in the closet for a while, and she got unpacked and shut the closet, and the baby just screamed louder. And then after about 15 minutes, the baby quit screaming. And she went over there and opened that door, and that baby was just as dead as you ever saw it, a rattlesnake in that closet. That happened, Associated Press. I'll tell you another case happened up in West Virginia. This happened about eight years ago. I got the clippings over there at the house. A man up there in one of those coal mining places had a, his little boy come in, his hand all swollen up, and said, Daddy, I hurt myself. And the old man said, well, what? He says, a nail under the house. The old man said, well, run on, play, put some iodine on it, send him out. And about five minutes later, the little girl came in, and she was all swollen up. And she said, Daddy, snake. And the old man got up under that house, and there was a, a copper mouth, or a copperhead snake under that house that bit both those kids. And that old man was just in distraction. His wife wasn't there. Put that boy and girl in the car, backed out to go to the hospital, and ran over his third child. Killed him. Back him out. And got to the hospital, and both kids died before he got to the hospital. That old boy wound up in the insane asylum. I mean, three of them went in just about an hour and 15 minutes. And listen, when you tend to underestimate the sin, 
and laugh at sin and joke at sin and take sin lightly. You won't remember things like that. Sin's a killer. Sin's a killer. Bible says, be sure you're a sin of fine jowl. Over in London during the 19th century, there was a great preacher named Gerganus. And Gerganus, one day when he preached, he used for illustration out of, for his sermon, an article he picked up out of the newspaper. And back in those days, that was considered to uh, be real sensational. But a, a drunk had got loose in the London Zoo at night and gone down the snake pit. And that drunk got loose at night and climbed down the snake pit and began to walk around the snakes and kick him with his foot and saying, uh, I'm God, you can't hurt me, I'm God, you can't hurt me. And the zookeeper heard that thing and came down and poked his head down in the pit and said, my God, you fool, get out of there, get out of there. He said, I'm enchanted, they can't hurt me, watch me. And he reached down there and picked up a diamond back rattler and flopped that thing up over his shoulder, went up over his shoulder, went down his back, and round his waist, dropped off between his legs, then went around there and he got a hold of a copperhead there and picked him up and put him in his mouth and threw like and danced around with him with the snakes flopping up and down in his mouth. And that zookeeper went to get a doctor. And that fellow went all around there and got him a Morocco venom snake and put that snake up on his shoulder. And that old snake went up and went around his neck and then slipped down over his arm and slipped around his waist and down between his legs and slipped off between his toes. And finally got over there and he got him a king cobra. And he kicked that thing up and put it up against his chest and got warm enough to move a little bit. About that time I come back with the doctor. And that old cobra went up over one shoulder and down one arm and slipped around his waist a couple of times and up around. And then that cobra just came up right in front like that, and that old hood spread, and that old king cobra just stood up there for just about one minute, and then right between the eyes. And blood running down that drunk's face, and he tore that thing off, screaming, saying, my God, I'm a dead man, my God, I'm a dead man, and tried to get out of there, and doctor got there, and zookeeper got down there, got the fellow up over the bank. Ten minutes he couldn't see, twenty minutes he couldn't hear, thirty minutes he couldn't speak, forty minutes he just stone cold dead. And I tell you, that sin may not get you 10 or 20, but 30, 40, 50, 60, ship will come in. Ship will come in. Remember now thy creator, the days thy youth. Amen? Amen. 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 You say, well, how do you get out of it? Well, the Bible says that the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God. And you see this fellow right here? Now, as long as he just lies there and says, I'm as good as anybody else, he can go with the bones. And if he gets baptized, he just brings up a wet serpent instead of a dry one. I mean, that isn't going to do it. And all the fellow lies there and says, well, I don't feel anything. In they go. Well, I'm just not ready to live it yet. In they go. You know what he has to do? The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He has to call for help. You know, a fellow get a mess like that, you know what he better be calling? He better be calling, help! He better have him be calling, where'd Cain get his wife? <laughs> a fellow get that mess, how do you know the Bible's right? <laughs> That's how you know it's right. It's killing you, brother. And you know, when a man gets in a mess like that, the Bible says, who serves should call upon the name of the Lord should be saved. That man needs to call on God. Now Christ, the Word of God. The Bible said in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same in the beginning with God. All things are made by Him. Without Him, uh, no, nothing was made that was made. Uh, he was the light of men in the world. The world knew Him not. Uh, the Bible says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing asunder between the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, I'm telling you how to get saved. You get saved by that. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And yet, at the same time, I'm telling you how to be saved. I'm telling every Christian in this building tonight how to get victory over sin. Prayer and the word. You know what Christ said? He said, sanctify them with the word. Thy word is truth. That's the cleansing agent. Didn't you read Ephesians chapter 5? Cleanse it by the washing of the water of the Word. Didn't you read over there, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those are the two things. And Christian people, God bless your heart, just as soon as you quit praying and put up that Word, then the old snake starts coming in. Don't he? Don't he? Can't you feel that pressure? 
Not old hot breath. See those old glassy eyes? Not old split pupil like a cat pupil just about that far from your face? You know what every Christian ought to do? He ought to go to every zoo he can go to that has snakes in it and just stand in that cage and study those snakes for about 30 minutes. And I'll tell you, if you just look at that snake, just look at that snake, and look at that thing, and look at that thing, and remember the Bible likens that to sin, when you get tempted to get envious and jealous and gripey and complainy and discouraged and sensual and tired and bitter and all that business, you look at that thing and you just instinctively just draw back. God put that in there. But it's prayer and the Word. Now, if I'm talking to some Christian knight that's whipped and defeated and the devil's got you down and the sinner has you down, he's going to get the victory if you're not careful. I don't recommend anything to you than the old-fashioned remedy that was recommended to me when I got saved and had been recommended to every Christian that ever lived since Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Paul said, I recommend you to the Lord and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Paul says, it's able to build you up. Peter says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The cleansing agents for sin are prayer and the word. And if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Let's bow our heads for prayer.